welcome everybody to the last day, the last session. Woohoo! I know you're happy. I'm happy as well. This has been a, a fabulous um, um, conference. I've gotten so much out of it, and I'm glad we've arrived at this point. Um, I'm Paula Stewart. I'm with the City and County of San Francisco. I'm a senior environmental health inspector there. I've been there for 21 years. And um, in my primary capacity as senior inspector with uh, the Coupa in San Francisco is I am a um, lead inspector for 10 district staff. I'm the technical advisor for the district staff and I am the lead enforcement officer for our county. I also um, um, met up with the folks at the Environmental Training Center, Northern California Environmental Training Center about five years ago and um, I'm now on board with teaching the designated operator classes that they offer through Mission College. So I, I train people to become designated operators as well. So um, that's me and uh, we're just gonna go ahead and get started. So like I said, I've been around a long time and so I, I know a lot of um, owners and operators and when this requirement first came about, people start buzzing about it in 2004 and they were like, oh Paul, I heard I'm gonna have to go back to school. What is this thing I'm hearing about this certification that I have to have in order to operate my gas station? What is this gonna cost me? How am I benefiting from this? If I hire this person that's going to be this, this special inspector, are they going to take responsibility? Are they going to be responsible for what goes on at my gas station? Who's really accountable? So in trying to answer those questions, I, I, I thought about that and I was, I was saying, yeah, you guys are under a lot of regulations and you do have a lot of testing requirements and um, inspection standards that you have to adhere to. So let's think about uh, what might be the benefits. Why, why might we need another requirement for underground storage tank owners and operators? So in trying to get to that answer, I thought I'd tell you a couple stories. These are real stories that happened in my county and I'll let you be the judge as to whether or not you think this program is a beneficial program. The first story that I'm gonna tell is called, Any Hole Will Do. This is a true story. What we're looking at here is a clean out pipe. This is a clean out pipe at a, at a uh, underground storage tank facility. The person um, that um, was responsible for the incident that happened here that involved this clean out pipe was a new facility employee. He had been on site for about five months, roughly five months, and he had been given responsibility to oversee a fuel drop at his facility. He had not received any training from the facility's designated operator. They had a designated operator program in, in place, but this poor guy had never received the required training. Now we all know that you have 30 days to train a new employee. So this guy was sent out to oversee this fuel drop. So he goes out, he flips out the first plate that he sees, and he said, that looks like a fill pipe to me. And uh, he proceeded to direct the fuel delivery driver to fill his tank. So he dumped about 400 gallons of diesel down into this clean out pipe that went directly to the sewer. Fortunately, it was only 400 gallons because the load that they had ordered was 2,500 gallons. What happened was the chief engineer showed up, saw what was going on and was just beside himself. He couldn't believe what he was seeing. He's like, stop, stop, what are you guys doing? That's the clean out pipe, that's not the tank. And so they did stop, but um, only after 400 gallons of diesel had been um, dropped into this clean-out pipe. Now they do have a fill pipe on their tank, and it wasn't much further away than where the clean-out pipe was, but because this facility employee had not been trained, they ended up having a very um, avoidable situation become a significant enforcement issue. So what happened here? What was the outcome for the, the, the owner and operator of this site? Who's really responsible? Was it, was it the fault of the delivery guy who, who delivers fuel for a living and should have recognized a fill pipe from a clean out pipe? Was it the responsibility of the owner operator? The owner operator is responsible for making sure that new employees are identified and trained by the designated operator. Is it the facility employee's fault? I decided that it wasn't the facility employee's fault. He was a victim in this situation. He was given a job assignment. He tried to do it to, his best, to the best of his ability. 
And um, furthermore, the laws and regulations hold the owner operator responsible for things like this. So the lesson learned in all of this, after all of the cleanup costs, the penalties that were assessed, and um, the loss of staff productivity and all the reports that had to be written, uh, the lesson learned is that training really does matter. A small issue like training resulted in, in a huge catastrophic event that was easily avoidable. In this next case, I want to talk about is, this is the case of, hey, what's that gizmo? And this happened as well. This was a, a site. This is a rectifier for uh, an impressed current system. And this rectifier was unplugged, apparently had been disconnected for about eight months. The situation was there was a new site manager at this facility, and he knew that they had some guy that comes around once a month to take a look at their underground storage tanks, and he figured that this guy took care of their underground storage tank. There was nothing for him to worry about. Turns out the DO was aware of the piece of equipment, but had no idea that it had anything to do with the tank. He said, no one ever told me what that was for. So what ended up happening here is the DO blamed the site manager and his predecessor. The two managers blamed the DO. They said uh, he was paid, he was our expert, and was paid to manage our underground storage tanks. So their situation, unfortunately, nobody won. Their, uh, the owner and operator was assessed a fine from the agency, from us, and the, uh, the, the two parties ended up in litigation over who's responsible for the, the uh, unplugging of the, um, the rectifier and um, the breakdown in that monitoring program in violation of their operating permit. So the, the lessons learned on this one was, um, you know, there are many owners out there who feel like their DO is the expert. They don't really, once they hire their DO and they're paying him whatever they pay, they feel like they don't have to worry about their um, underground storage tank anymore. And we know that's not how the program works. The DO is, is your ally, they're not your expert. And the other thing is older systems are still out there. You know, we have a lot of, especially people come into San Francisco and they think everything is all bells and whistles with all the latest monitoring equipment, but this system was in San Francisco. It was uh, uh, upgraded from 1998, still tank, with an impressed current system. There was uh, poor communication between the owner and the, and the DO, and uh, the DO really hadn't, done due diligence to get a hold of the documents that would have had him be more informed about the type of equipment that was on site. So the program really works if, if people implement it. So what we're gonna do today is talk about the outcomes of both of these stories and how they could have been completely avoided because in both cases, these people had designated operators. So we're gonna look at the roles of all parties involved in a comprehensive designated operator program when it's appropriately um, implemented. Of course, we're gonna look at the role of the designated operator, but we're not gonna stop there because this is a comprehensive program. It only works when everybody who has responsibility for the tank is involved in the program. So we'll look at the roles of the UST owner and operator and their employees. We'll also look at what should happen when you're conducting a monthly inspection. There are some designated out, uh, programs out there that are working very well, so we'll take a look at those. And finally, we'll look at some um, common mistakes and how to avoid them. So people were asking, what are the benefits of the program? There are so many benefits to this program. From the inspector side, there are so many benefits to this program. I'm noticing that owners and operators have been so much more organized with their records and understanding of their monitoring programs and plans than before the program went into place. But one of the things that I really like about this program and that I identify as an immediate benefit is that I see an increased awareness as far as owners and operators are concerned in terms of best management practices for operating their facilities. They're more hands-on with what needs to happen with their monitoring plans. A lot of times people write plans and they go into a box or a book and they never read, they don't know the contents of it. And then facility employees are really getting um, 
relevant training that's site specific to the type of um, systems that they're operating. So I think that's one of the best benefits and all of this results in better protection of public health and safety and the environment. Fewer spills. So I already said that everybody has a role in this program. So we're gonna start by looking at these, these various roles. And we're gonna start right at the top with the owner and operator. Because the owner and operator is the person that's legally responsible for the underground storage tank. It doesn't matter who you hire to help you out. If you are the owner and operator of that tank, then you're responsible. You're the person who obtain the operating permit from the agency. You're the person who completed this form. And I wanna, you know, I don't know if people, when they complete these forms, if they take the time to actually look at the language. But this form is saying, I certify, and this is an owner operator, I certify that for this facility, the individual named above is the designated operator. I further certify that I will ensure that this person conducts the facility inspections in accordance with Title 23 of the California Code of Regulations and administers all employee training in accordance with the same. It doesn't say that the designated operator is certi certifying that this stuff will happen. It says the owner operator will certify that this happens. If it, it further says that I understand and, and I am in compliance with the requirements, statutes, regulations, and local ordinances applicable to underground storage tanks. That's the whole ball of wax. Once you sign this, that's ironclad. Owner operator is, is the person that's responsible. It doesn't really matter who you hire to help you out. The, at the end of the day, anything that goes wrong, the fault lies with the owner operator or the responsibility lies with the owner operator. So the owner operators also have to, um, in addition to submitting this statement of compliance that says they are aware of their responsibilities, they maintain the reports that are generated by the designated operators and they ensure that their facility staff are trained. So that's the role of the owner operator. Now the facility employee, the facility employee has a critical role as well. The facility employee has a critical role because they're most likely to be the first person to discover if there's a problem. They're gonna be the person to see that there's a spill or a release. They're gonna be the person to recognize that the system is in alarm. So obviously you want your facility employees trained. We're gonna talk about the training in a minute. Now let's look at the designated operator. Who is this person? The designated operator, basically the law says you are a designated operator if you pass the ICC certification exam that allows you to function as a designated operator. And if you maintain your certification current. There's nothing in the law that says you have to have experience inspecting underground storage tanks. There's nothing that says you have to be a gas station owner. There's nothing that says that you have to have spent X number of hours in the field with a technician. You just need to bone up on the requirements, pass the exam, and you can go out and, and um, offer your services as a designated operator. There are some great designated operators out there, and there are some guys who are learning on the job. So it's all over the place. Um, but once you become a designated operator, what you're required to do is conduct these monthly inspections and uh, stay on top of the uh, training for the facility employees. That's your role in this. So what does that training actually look like? And I, I'm really relying on these forms because everything is right here for us. If there's no mystery to this program. Um, there's actually something called a Designated Operator Facility Employee Training Record. And in this record, they take right out of the regulations the elements, the topics that you're required to cover in your training for facility employees. And one of the very first things it says is operation of the UST system in a manner consistent with the facility's best management practices. Now this is one where everybody usually falls down because some facilities don't have best management practices. 
When you ask for their best management practices, they hand you their hazardous materials business plan, they hand you their injury illness prevention plan, but we're just talking about simple things to help you manage your underground storage tank in accordance with industry practices. So if you're a designated operator and you've never laid hands on the facility's um, best management practices, written best management practices, then you're not fulfilling the first training bullet where you're required to train in a manner consistent with the facility's best management practices. Then it goes on to say that you are required to train the employees on their role in implementing the monitoring and response plans that are on file for the operating permit. Now, these monitoring and response plans are templates that um, that the Unified Program Agency has put together to make it easy for owners and operators to comply with completing a monitoring and response plan. So basically, you check some boxes, you fill in the uh, blanks, you sign your name and date, and you have a monitoring plan. Same thing with the response plan. But what's going on here? There's a lot of detail in these plans. When you sign these plans, you're saying that you're implementing all of the details that are written into these plans. I find so many people are not familiar with some of the language that's in these monitoring plans. So let me tell you some of the things you're agreeing to do. It says, if safe to do so, facility personnel will take immediate measures to control or stop any release. That means activating the pump shutoff and, if necessary, safely removing the remaining hazardous materials from the underground storage tank. That's one of the things that's in the written spill response plan that owners sign. It's one of the first bullets. There's a lot of other detail in here. In the monitoring plan, it talks about records that employees have to maintain, like alarm logs and visual inspection records. Some of these employees have never been told that they're required to conduct a, a checklist or what to do with the tapes that come out of the um, monitoring equipment. So the designated operator is responsible for getting a hold of this monitoring plan and this spill response plan and figuring out which of these duties that are listed here are going to be taken on by which employees. And they need to have buy-off from the, the owner and operator who dictates which, which jobs the employees will take care of. But there's a lot to these, so you don't want to just check the boxes, sign, and, and file it away because you're, you're agreeing to a lot of things. One of the other things that's in here, it says um, water, hazardous or non-hazardous, that is removed from sumps and spill containers will not be disposed to the storm drains. Now, how many times have you seen people pump water out of their spill buckets and let it run down to the storm drain because they say it has no sheen, it's only water. It's right in your response plan. You're in violation of the response plan that's a condition of your permit to operate the underground storage tank. So it's really, really important if, as a designated operator that you get a hold of these um, plans that are on file that are a condition of the operating permit for the, for the owner so that you'll know what training standards you should be following to um, fulfill the, re the, the training requirements under the designated operator program. Okay, we talked about the fact that you have to train your employees in accordance with best management practices. Best management practices is actually defined in regulation, but you know, if we just use some common sense, we can think about some best management practices. Like it's a best manage, it makes sense not to hose down your lot if you're a gas station, because what might you be hosing down? Um, oily sediment, gasoline, drippings, any number of things that will ring the hazardous waste bill. When you hose your lot down, these things are going into a storm drain. It makes sense, it's a best management practice not to put dirty, soaked absorbent into the solid waste stream, into your trash. Employees should know that that material could be a hazardous waste. It makes sense, it's a best management practice not to raise sensors in the sumps, even when you know that the, the sensor went into alarm because it's raining and uh, you have a leaky sump. It makes sense to follow the equipment maintenance recommendations that comes with the owner's manual. These are the kinds of things that are considered best management practices. And there are a whole host of other best management practices that are available 
for free in this case. This is the operating and maintaining underground storage tank systems. You can get this right off the water board's website for free. Full of best management practices. That's what this is all about. So if you're an owner and operator and you don't have a best management practice um, written document, you need to develop one and you need to make sure you meet with your designated operator and so that they know what it is. The other best management practices that are now part of the designated op operator exam comes out of the PEI um, um, recommended practices. There's PEI uh, 900 and 500. These are all about best management practices. So even if the ones that I just mentioned um, are not enough for you and you want to beef your program up to be something else, there's lots of resources for developing best management practices. But what I wanted to show, this is like uh, a situation where best management practice went, was not employed and people were hosing down their driveway. Now what you need to know, I think I told you guys I'm the enforcement officer for my county. So whenever I have a picture, you can, that's a case. This, this was a case. The oil layer here was about three inches thick from just over time uh, rinsing down the driveway. He didn't mean any harm, he's just trying to clean up his driveway so when his customers come in, he has a clean place for them to, to park their cars and get out and walk around his facility. He has a little uh, snack bar, people can hang out while they're waiting for their, their smog check to get done. But this is what happened over time. I happened on this, this is an obvious hazardous waste violation and you know, we took the appropriate action. It's an unfortunate situation, it's one that's very avoidable. I told this guy, why do you have a garden hose hanging right here in your garage? Get rid of this thing. It tempts people to want to rinse something down. That's what you do with a garden hose. Uh, don't have a garden hose at your gas station. That's a best management practice, don't use those. This is another situation, best management practice. Actually, this one didn't result in a fine, I'm happy to say. This is a situation where um, it had rained and so there's water in this spill bucket and we know that spill buckets have to be maintained free of water and debris. So a best management practice would be after a heavy rain, somebody needs to go out and, and pump the water out of the spill bucket. This is a case, and I don't know if you can see it that well, this was after a fuel delivery. There's about three inches of red diesel still in the spill bucket. You don't want to leave that in there, there are a number of reasons, but the main thing is let's say another rain comes through and that fuel gets pushed out. Now you have an unauthorized release. So you want to clean spill buckets out after every delivery. That's a best management practice. Now I want to talk about getting prepared for the inspection. So I, told, I said that in order to get prepared for the inspection, you have to know some specifics about the, about the site, about the tank characteristics. And what I recommend to everybody is if you don't already have one, you need to establish some sort of UST compliance binder, folder, box, whatever you want to call it. And all of these documents that were listed in those last two slides should be indexed in this binder so that you can easily, when your designated operator comes on site, you can easily pull out your monitoring plan and you can say, hey, I need you to be familiar with this monitoring plan because this is what our, our facility operations are based on and these are the employees and their roles and what they're going to have to do relative to my monitoring plan and, my, and relative to my spill response plan. I, didn't hold this up earlier, but every monitoring plan also comes with a site layout. It tells you where the tanks are and all the sensors that are associated with the system. So you want to have these things. And this is really easy to put together. So if you don't have that, go ahead and, and put that together. It'll make your life a lot easier. Okay, so now we have all the information we need. We have the information about the tank we know how many tanks are at this location, we know how many sensors. It's real easy to conduct our inspection now. Nothing is hidden from us. There are two tanks, the sensor setup tape tells us that there are five sensors and we can pretty much see where those sensors are. There are two um, STP sums, two annular sensors and then there's a waste oil tank on the, on the setup tape. So no, no mystery here. You pull your sensor alarm history and you conduct your, um, you look in your spill buckets and 
um, UDCs, and, and you're pretty comprehensive on this. You uh, report your findings to the, the owner operator. Now this, this site is also a pretty simple setup. All of the sensors are on the tank top pad or in the UDC. Nothing is hidden from you. So it's a pretty straightforward inspection. You pull the sensor setup tape, you match all the sensors to what you see at the site, and you make sure that everything is accounted for. So there are a lot more sumps here, but everything is readily um, visible and accounted for based on the monitoring plan that you've reviewed and the sensor setup tape. Now we're gonna take a look at a site that's a little bit more complicated. This is uh, what I call the complex setup. Uh, this is complex because this is a VPH system and you have um, only four sumps per, per tank, but what's going on is there are multiple sensors per sump. You have your, your uh, leak sensors, you have your hyd hydrostatic sensors, the smart sensors for the vacuum, and um, then there are annular space sensors um, to monitor their optical annular space sensors to monitor for um, liquid intrusion into the annular space of these tanks. So the point here is that you have to be aware, pull the sensor setup tape, be aware of all of the types of sensors that are on the system. This system has a little over 30 sensors on this, on this system. So when you're pulling an alarm history, it's kind of easy to overlook a sensor if you're not going step by step, matching it to the monitoring plan that diagrams all of the sensors for you, as well as the site setup tape. This one I included because this, this is a site that has kind of some extra sumps, sumps that you don't normally see. So this is a manifolded uh, tanks, and so what they did is they installed these two extra sumps here so that they can isolate. There's nothing in those but a valve box that allows them to isolate one tank from, from the other. The point is when you get to any site, you wanna know what's underneath every sump, what the function is, how it's being monitored. All of, this, all of these sumps are um, double wall, hydrostatically monitored sumps. So there's a whole bunch of sensors associated with this as well. Uh, I think I'll just skip to the next, because you get the point. There's, um, those green ones are the uh, STP sumps. The blues are just some extra, that's, uh, they put in some extra sumps just in case they want to add additional equipment. The annular is right behind that. You have the uh, fill sumps and then the TLM sumps. So all of those sumps have multiple sensors associated with them. Multiple sensors, line leak detectors, there's a lot of leak detection equipment that you're gonna be pulling alarm history for on your VPH sites. Okay, so now we've got our site set up together. We've um, looked at the sumps and uh, matched everything up to the monitoring plan and we're ready to go to look at the monitoring panel. We see all functions normal. That's a good thing, all functions normal. Does that necessarily mean that we don't need to look into the sumps? If you, up, if you get to a, a, a panel and it says all functions normal, do you need to go any further at that point? Are you good? Let's see what the directions say. It says sumps where an alarm has occurred in the past month must be inspected unless a qualified service technician has responded to and properly addressed the alarm. So what that tells me is, okay, all functions are normal, but I really don't know if an alarm has occurred since I was last here. The only way I'm gonna know that is to pull the alarm history report. So you pull the alarm history report, you either see an alarm condition or you don't. Um, if you see an alarm and you can't match it to a service record, then you're gonna have to inspect that sump. So just because, and I'm gonna show you some pictures later that are kind of shocking, um, the panel says all functions normal, but when you get to the sump, things were far from normal. This one is straightforward, fuel alarm. You go straight to that sump, investigate the cause of the alarm, and um, make a record of it on your, on your inspection report. And I'm gonna talk about the inspection reports a little bit more. You don't wanna just make a record of it. You have to communicate to the owner operator because you're part of this team. You're part of this compliance team. So if you just make a really good record but never tell anybody, follow it away, you're not helping your owner operator. 
I like this, um, this display because it tells you exactly where the sensor is that's in alarm. You don't have to refer to the uh, site setup. It says it's the generator STP sump, and it even tells us what kind of sensor. Uh, the nomenclature on this particular model, SN2 means two-wire sensor, which is the same as a, a L sensor on the Vita route. It's just a leak sensor. This is an INCON system. We don't have to worry about those other uh, alarms there because they have to do with product management. We're only interested in alarms that have to do with leaks. There's no back alarm. This is a smart sensor that's saying that uh, it's not sensing a vac, uh, the vacuum has been lost. Now what I tell people to do with these, because with a no vac alarm, even if you go in, and open up the sump, you're not gonna be able to do anything. The thing you need to do when you see a no vac alarm is document that alarm and make sure you tell the owner operator immediately because they're gonna need a service call to that site. You're not gonna be able to do anything to manipulate that no vac alarm to clear it unless you are a certified licensed cert service technician. So when you see a no vac alarm, that means that one of the smart sensors has um, sensed a loss of vacuum on one of the lines or one of the components that it's monitoring. So I would say that's the only time that you don't need to actually open up the sump. You, you need to make that a service call. Okay, so sumps where alarms have occurred in the past month. And remember I told you that a lot of times the monitoring panel will say, all systems normal, but, but you can't find a service record, so you have to open that sump anyway. Let me show you some of the ones that I found. If I find them, it's a compliance inspection when I find them. So that, these are bad. This is a bad situation. This is a, a site where this um, operator had leaky sumps, historically leaky sumps. So every rainy season, he's getting water intrusion into his sump. It annoys the heck out of him because he goes into positive shutdown and he can't pump gas. And it's a nuisance. So what he did when, when the first rain hit and his sensor went into alarm, he put in a bucket to clear the alarm. And it was fine for a while, but it was a really, really heavy rainy season that year. And look what happened. The whole sump filled up. Uh, he forgot about it because he went back to doing whatever it is he does for a living. And uh, so this sensor, once it, the bucket was overcome, he takes the sensor and puts it over here. Still didn't have time to pump out the water and manage this, this alarm situation correctly. The violation on this, the penalties on this exceeded $200,000. Do you know why? Because it's deliberate tampering with a monitoring device. When you raise a sensor, it's not just called raising a sensor. It's called deliberate tampering with a monitoring device. So this monitoring device was raised. The beta route told us the date that it went into alarm, and we were able to calculate the penalties, $5,000 per day per violation. Lucky for him, now, the, there were a couple violations with this because failure to detect a release at the earliest opportunity, in addition to deliberate tampering with the monitoring device. Um, we settled for far less than what his exposure was and gave him a, a stiff warning. But the penalty still hurt. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but you know, I, I work in San Francisco. From time to time, I get a parking ticket. It's $63. I have a cow when I get one of those. I certainly don't want one of these violations. I can't even imagine getting one of these violations. It, I mean, it's horrible and it's unnecessary. You don't raise sensors. I mean, there was some discussion here yesterday that I took exception with because it had to do with people moving sensors around. Moving sensors is serious business. Whoever if they happen to not get that sensor in the lowest point where it can detect a release at the earliest opportunity and the regulator finds that, that's a problem for that owner operator. That's a serious problem. So I, we're gonna look at, this is another situation. I can't believe these. The, the monitoring panel said all functions normal, but I couldn't match a record to it. So I'm like, okay, all functions normal. Uh, what caused this sensor to go into alarm? The sensor, is it even, yeah, here it is. This, is. this is about 18 inches of diesel from a transfer pump that went crazy. 
Uh, so what this person did, they took their sensor to clear the alarm and put it up in this tray and just let the transfer pump keep spewing diesel into the sump. The fortunate thing for them is that the compliance inspection was scheduled for a couple days later. So this thing would have actually overcome this sump. It was, it was putting out quite a bit of diesel. And it was like such an egregious thing. I, I couldn't believe that someone can see that amount of diesel in a sump on a first alarm and, and not take further action. But that's what happened. So this is, that's, this is before um, des designated operator and best management practices and you know, better training and understanding. These are the kind of things that were going on. It's like, okay, I'll just shut that, that, that box up. It's annoying me. So they put the sensor in the tray. You know, we know when it went into alarm because the beta root tells us. Plus you have all this diesel. This is, a, this is, an, this is an increase of a, a risk of public health and safety for sure. If it rained, you were gonna be spewing all that out of that sump. Bad business. Another uh, situation, and this particular uh, situation, the, the monitoring panel actually did, was, was still an alarm. So we opened this up and we found that this is gasoline. Luckily, that's a really deep sump because you know, even though all the no smoking signs are up at gas stations and what have you, people come in smoking. Once this gasoline is, is, a, is not in the underground storage tank anymore, you have definitely increased the risk of fire hazard. That's a lot of gasoline. And they left that sensor in alarm. I think in this case, it was a couple of weeks, if I'm not mistaken, of gasoline. I think the designated oper operator program was needed. People needed to have some better understanding of how to manage their sites. Okay, so we're moving right along. We've talked about the panel alarms, sensor alarms, what to do. So we're gonna look at spill buckets now. Spill buckets, you, you inspect a spill bucket every inspection. We talked about with sumps, you don't always have to look in the sump unless there's a condition that warrants that you look in the sump. But with a spill bucket, it's every inspection without exception. You look in the spill bucket, you want it to be free of liquid and debris. You look in the um, under dispenser containment. Now, some under dispenser containment is nice and shallow like this, so you can easily see that it's free of liquid and debris. But can you tell what's going on down in here? No, you can't. So you need some, you need some actual like, um, PPE and equipment when you're doing these inspections. I always, I, these, these are used because I use them. I mean, they, they're scratched up because I put these on. When I'm ready to look into a dispenser uh, that's, that's a deep dispenser, I put on my knee pads, I get a, a, a really sh uh, bright flashlight because I wanna illuminate the situation. I wanna see what's going on in there. And so I have a really bright flashlight that I shine down in there. This is really bright. Maybe it doesn't show up that well here, but trust me, it's bright, okay? <laughs> I like this little thing. It's lightweight, and uh, it lets me know what's going on down in those UDCs. Okay, this one is pretty easy to see. So as a designated operator, what you want to do is make sure that this is the, the monitoring device for this, for this uh, dispenser. It's a chain float. So you want to make sure that there's no liquid accumulated in this reservoir and that the chain is connected to the trigger device and that it is taunt enough so that if this float rose, that it would trigger the shear valve. I never said adjust the chain. I just said use your best judgment to say whether or not you think it's tight enough. If you don't think it's tight enough, you write it up in your report and you notify the owner operator. They'll have somebody come out and adjust the chains. I don't recommend that designated operators handle any uh, monitoring equipment unless they are a licensed, certified technician. That's just the, that's a best management practice, in my opinion. I've had too many cases where the sensor was in the wrong position, and I'm about to show you one right now. This one is fine. You're looking inside of a UDC, sensor's at the lowest point, it's a flat UDC, so no problem. No low point other than the, the bottom of the uh, UDC. 
There's a little debris, but I don't make a big deal about that. That's not going to interfere with the float mechanism within the sensor. I don't expect to be able to eat out of the dispenser pans. Oh, this was an unusual dispenser. Um, <coughs> that, is a, that does meet the definition of a dispenser, believe it or not. Um, the problem with this, and the reason I wanted to show you guys, this is a, a brand new installation, a BPH system. They installed this dispenser with no UDC. So they haven't been able to get a permit for these tanks yet, and they spent a lot of money at this site. So now they're doing engineered controlled, um, an engineered fabrication to, to put UDC on these sumps, on these uh, dispensers. The regulatory definition of a dispenser is, is any device that is used for the delivery of a hazardous substance from an underground storage tank. It includes the metering and delivery devices and fabricated assemblies. So this whole thing is the dispenser and the whole thing has to be in UDC. They're not happy campers right now, but they, they can't, I don't have, as a COOPA, I don't have the authority to waive the state requirements. They're required to have UDC. I ran it through the state and it came back, we want UDC on that. So that's the best I could do for them. I, I ran it up the chain of the command and it came back, no, put the UDC in. So that's gonna cost them a lot of money, that little oversight. Anyway, this, is a, this has a shear valve trigger so you're, expect, you're inspecting this, you want to make sure it's engaged. It has an emergency stop. I always like to know where the emergency stops are when I'm inspecting any site in case I need to use it. Um, it has nothing to do with the designated operator inspection, it's just a safety feature. But this is a standard dispensing um, system, it just looks a little strange. So you're done with the physical inspection, now you have to do your paperwork review. In the paperwork review, you're required to um, know which equipment testing and maintenance is required for the facility. Where is that going to come from? Once again, the monitoring plan. It's all spelled out. You don't have to guess about this stuff. The monitoring plan has already been submitted to the agency and approved. So you don't have to guess which test the facility needs. It says right here in the monitoring plan and it says the frequency of the test. The other thing you do on your records review is you make sure that new facility employees have been identified and that you get them trained up within 30 days of their hire date and that the annual um, training for existing employees employees is current. So one of the common things that happens is uh, DOs uh, write people up for needing uh, tests and maintenance and stuff that's not required for the type of system that they have. So the only thing I want to emphasize here is that there's no one size fits all. The type of monitoring and testing is based on um, the type of UST construction the date of installation, and the owner-operator options. So really, once again, take your cue from the monitoring plan. This has been approved, so you don't have to write the, the owner-operator or re recommend that they have tests that are not, re not required for their type of operation. I had somebody write a, uh, write a owner up or recommend that he have a tank integrity test. He has a double wall brine fill system. He doesn't need a tank integrity test. So he's trying to go out and figure out how to do a tank integrity test, and you know, that's, that's I'm, I'm glad he called me before he actually tried to do it, because I don't know what that would have cost him. But anyway, things like that. So I put this together to just give an idea of the, the, the component and the testing frequency and when it applies. Okay, so we're completing the inspection report. So anything that you found that requires further action, it needs to be written up on the monthly inspection report. There's a comments section. Oftentimes, it's just as blank as you see it today, even though there are a bunch of things on this side with findings. So if there's a finding, there needs to be a corresponding comment for that finding. If there were um, alarms, they need to be written up and addressed on this, on this inspection report. So it can be as simple as attaching the, uh, the maintenance record from the technician that responded to the alarm. You always want to attach an alarm history. Now, you're not required to, 
attach the alarm history in this manner, but this is what we prefer. We prefer you to take your alarm histories, put them on notebook paper, and put it in a binder so it's easy for us to review. You're not gonna get dinged if you don't do it this way. I get a lot of them like this. I can't really review this. I have to tear this apart. So what that means is I'm gonna be on your site at, in your office a lot longer than I wanna be and then you would want me to be. I get out of your hair a lot quicker if you make it easy for me to review your alarm history. So it's your choice. I can do it either way. I come with a staple remover and I just tear them apart. So, um, but this is the recommended, this is a best management practice. This works too, you're in compliance. Um, but any findings, you've written up a wonderful report, I have, all, I have this happen a lot, wonderful report, the owner knows nothing about what you found. You found uh, um, fuel in the, in the uh, UDC, you didn't tell the owner. You found, um, you found uh, fuel in the sumps, you didn't tell the owner. So anything that you find, you need to let the owner know because ultimately they're responsible. The buck stops with them. And they're gonna be pretty upset with you if they're paying you to be their eyes and ears and then you don't communicate your findings. So we're gonna um, talk about some common mistakes and omissions, things, and a lot of these I've already talked about. Um, tests being ordered that aren't required, expired ICCs, employee training, alarms not um, properly responded to, people not aware of all of the sensors and equipment on the site. We're gonna take a look at some of these things. So this, um, this one was a, a dispenser that had a red bag over it when I came on site. I looked at the DO report to say, okay, it's, uh, the DO was just here the other day, so I can look at their report and find out what's going on with this without looking in the dispenser myself. So looked at the DO report, there was no record of this. This is a, a standalone sensor. There was a red bag over the dispenser because this sensor was in alarm. And when it, a standalone sensor, when it goes into alarm, it doesn't shut down the turbine, it just shuts down at the dispenser, turns off the dispenser. So what do you have? You still have product being pumped into that UDC. And that's why this sensor was in alarm. So if you see a red bag over a dispenser, that's one that you should be particularly interested in. Anyway, this sensor was in alarm. Thankfully, this sensor was at the low point in the sump. See how this sump kind of um, is on a, a, a slant? But fortunately, this one was at the low point, and so they were able to detect the release at the earliest opportunity. They just didn't do anything about it. But at least they weren't in violation for not detecting at the earliest opportunity. This is a, at the same site, this sensor, they have a systemic problem because their UDCs are taking on product. Anyway, here's the sensor over here. It's not in the low point. Now here, this is a violation. Now who wants to be the one responsible for having put this, this, this sensor here rather than here? This is, this, is a, this is a serious violation. You're not detecting at the lowest opportunity and you have fuel building up in your containment sumps. Um, this is just a, a transition box that was identified on the monitoring plan and on the um, sensor setup tape, but that the DO was not pulling an alarm history for because he wasn't aware of that, that particular containment sump. These are um, vapor lines, and with these VPH systems, the, the vapor lines are always gonna have a vapor box, so another situation where the containment sump wasn't readily um, noticeable. It was on the setup report, on the monitoring um, plan, but the DO was not pulling an alarm history for it. This, this is a failure to recognize the equipment that's on site. This goes back to that cathodic protection. When you're walking a site, you wanna be aware of all of the plates and what, what they mean. It may or may not have something, anything to do with your 
inspection, but you certainly want to be aware of them. This one right here, it tells, says right there, it's cathodic protection. And this even says cathodic protection test station. This was at the site where the DO missed the rectifier. It's all these hints that that, that site was uh, under cathodic protection. Okay, now we're going to look at what works best. What works best is being prepared, getting all the documents that you need in order to review and know what's at the site. So that's the monitoring plan, the response plan, the best management practices, knowing all the specifics, and, and establishing good communication with your owner operator. Also, you need the equipment to do the work. You can't do a designated operator inspection without tools. There are going to be times when you need to get into sumps. You can see these sumps. Some of them are easy to get off. Others aren't. Many of these sumps are bolted down. So without a socket wrench, you're not getting into these sumps. So if they're an alarm, you're not going to be able to do the inspection. And I think that might be some of the reasons that sumps don't get inspected, because people don't have the tools to do the job. So you, you need a flathead screwdriver, you need a socket wrench, you just need some basic tools so that you can do the job. You want to be familiar with the layout of the site, even if it's unusual. So this sensor setup tells us that there are eight sensors on this system. And this tells us, uh, this line is showing you how this tank is actually aligned. So we can see that there are two extra sumps that are not on the tank line. So what are those sumps for? You just want to take a look at those. Turns out that this one here is just a, a fancy Chrissy box, and it has electrical equipment, and it has nothing to do with the tank. So no worries there. But this one is where the transfer pump is. So you just kind of want to be aware of what's under each um, lid. Here you have a situation where there are some sensors. These were identified on the sensor setup tape, but you wouldn't have necessary. That's another Chrissy box with, it, had, it says water on it, but actually there are sensors associated with the tank underneath that. And the only reason I knew about these is because they're on the sensor setup tape and on the monitoring plot plan. They're clearly identified. So you, you want to make sure that you know the specifics about the site that you're at. Allow adequate time to do the job. Make sure that you, you inspect sumps when you're required to. Inspect UDCs and spill buckets every time, and always, always communicate your findings to the designated, I mean, to the um, owner operator. Now, if you have, if it turns out that you are inspecting a sump, you want to take advantage of the fact that the sump is open and make sure that these boots are recessed so that this line has a way to drain, because that's going to help your owner operator stay out of violation for um, preventing the monitoring device or blocking their monitoring device. Secondary containment on the secondary piping should always uh, have a way to drain from the secondary pipe back to the sump. This is a situation where the uh, piping did not have a way to drain. And this was doing a monitor certification that this was discovered. So this pipe was sealed onto the, I mean, this boot was sealed onto the secondary pipe. This Schrader uh, valve was capped off. And when the technician removed the cap off the Schrader valve, gasoline shot out of this thing under such pressure that it rose about three feet out of the sump. The guy that was opening up the cap on this, because I'm like, uh, that can't drain. I need that to drain. Can you open that up and so we can make sure that it can drain? And when he opened it up, he got a snoot full of gasoline. Of course, he recoiled. You guys know how tight those sumps are? He got a big gash on the back of his head. So this owner operator, he, the owner operator had a tester that came in and did some secondary containment testing and left the boot sealed. But who gets the fine in this situation? It's always the owner operator. Uh, secondary piping, non-VPH, we're talking non-VPH, open systems. Non-VPH piping, it has to have a way to drain. That's how the monitoring works on it. So even if you have these tight sealed boots and you don't want to unseal them, you can leave them sealed, but you have to take the cap off that Schrader valve. And you have to remove the innards from that. The, there's a poppet in there. You have to remove that. 
so that that piping can drain. Here's a situation. This one is actually in compliance. You can see that this boot is sealed onto the secondary pipe. But here's the, the strader, and it has a way to drain. And I actually use a mirror so I can hold it up under there and make sure that the innards are removed. That pipe has a way to drain, so no violation there. But ideally, you want your, your test boots fully recessed with a way for your secondary pipe to drain because that's what this sump sensor is there for to determine if there's any liquid accumulation into those sumps. And then this is just a look into a BPH sump just to point out the fact that there are multiple sensors associated with one sump. So testing one hasn't taken care of the, the, the entire situation. And some of them are hidden, like this is the, uh, you can barely see, this is the connection where the um, optical sensor goes into the angular space of that tank. So it drops down from, from this point. This, these tanks are 40,000 gallons each. It drops down quite a ways to the bottom of that tank. These are the hydrostatic sensors that are monitoring the double wall um, um, liquid filled sumps. And then this is the standard sump sensor that you would have in any tank system. Sometimes you can inspect a sump just by looking through the viewports. And so what I do with these is like I can see liquid down in there. I don't want to take the top off. So you can use um, water and product finding paste on the end of a stick just to determine if it's liquid or fuel. Plus you, want to, you don't want to get down there and take a whiff of it because if it is gasoline, you've just had a um, significant exposure if you take a big snoot of that. So you use your water paste. If the gold paste turns pink, you know you have water. I usually start with the water paste. If the gold paste doesn't turn pink, then I don't even um, go to the product paste. I just say it was non, uh, the liquid was not water. OK, here's some other sources and references for you. Um, the State Water Resources Control Board has a wealth of information on the designated operator program. These slides are on the um, Cal Cooper website, so these, uh, these links are available to you. But they have a wealth of information on their uh, website. Unidocs has all of the designated operator forms that I referenced here today. And then PEI is where you would, uh, who you would contact to get these, um, these recommended practices. So at the beginning, I asked the question. I asked, is it worth it? Is it worth it to go through all of this and protect the waters of the state? And I said, I'll let you be the judge. So that's what I'm going to do. I'll let you be the judge. We have a beautiful state. Our bodies of water are gorgeous. I'm an outdoors person. I want to go fishing. I love fishing, you can tell. I love our coastlines. Is it worth it to protect the waters of our state? I say yes. Thank you.